Letters from Spain. Letter 14. Public education. Hello. Well, I've come back to work from a rather pleasant weekend to celebrate our third anniversary. Rebecca and I took a little trip to the Madrid Mountains. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful place, the Madrid Mountains. The Guadarrama. The Sierra de Guadarrama. The, the geography is、uh, dominated by gray granite formations, a material that also forms many of the local buildings. And the landscape is covered in pine trees. So you can imagine it's, it's quite beautiful. There are endless trails for hiking, lots of cute little villages to visit.、Uh, the pueblo we happened to be in was Bustar Viejo.、Uh, it's populated by a bunch of hippies who. Who eat vegetarian meals up in the mountains and drink craft beer. There's actually a craft beer festival in this little pueblo, and they have, they have a, their own local brew called Bailanderas, which is the beer was quite delicious. So, nice little escape from the city center. Of course, the biggest thing happening this week, as far as holidays are concerned, is Valentine's Day. Although, to be honest, not a Particularly important day in Spain. It hasn't really caught on here like it's caught on in the United States.、Uh, and a lot of Spanish people who I ask about it don't seem to like it very much. They, they think it's just commercial, they think it's just a silly thing that's imported from America. But much like Halloween, even though it's not the most popular at the moment, it gets more popular every year. Who knows? Maybe I should have done this podcast on comparing the culture of love between America and, and Spain, but in my experience, it's not really that different. So I don't think that would be a particularly interesting topic. So instead, today,、uh, I'm not going to talk about vacation or love. I'm going to talk about something that's a source of envy for a lot of American people, particularly young Americans public education. Specifically, public higher education for the most part. So, as with the cost of medicine, the cost of university in Europe is strikingly lower than it is in America. To give you an extreme example, going to New York University, NYU, for one year costs over $70,000. $70,000. Admittedly, NYU is one of the most expensive universities in the world. But even if you want to go to a much more modest college in America, like I did, you could still pay quite a lot by international standards. In my case, I went to a public university, Stony Brook, and I had to pay well over $20,000 a year. Meanwhile, Rebecca went to the Universidad Autonoma de Madrid, the、uh, public university of Madrid, basically, the autonomous university, which is considered to be one of the best universities in Spain. And she paid around 3,000 euros per year. And a chunk of that was covered by a scholarship. Needless to say, she didn't need to go into debt to get an education. Meanwhile, I graduated with well over $20,000 of debt, and I'm still paying it off. So, what is the deal with this huge price difference? It's worth remembering that this wasn't always the case in America. Every millennial has heard stories of baby boomers, boomers working their way through college. Working your way through college. That's a phrase that is, makes a lot of millennials go crazy. Just the other day, I heard an eco- economics professor say that he paid for his college by you know, getting a part time job lifting boxes during the summers. Now, clearly, that is impossible nowadays in America. So it's worth asking what the deal is. What has happened? Obviously, a big difference between、uh, Spain and America or Europe and America is how much the state subsidizes higher education. In Spain, as in many European countries, the government foots the bill, or at least most of the bill. It, it varies a lot from country to country. In Germany, I think it's mostly free. In the Scandinavian countries, it's free. In Spain, you still have to pay a little bit, but not nearly as much. 
You can make the argument, therefore, that in Europe, college isn't really free after all, since the people pay for it with higher taxes. That's one side of the story, of course, and it's a big side to the story. I'm not an expert in taxation or government spending. But I think there's another less mentioned aspect to the college cost debate, and that's the culture of college, which is quite different. In America, going to university is a rite of passage. It's been turned into a basic phase of young adulthood. You live away from your parents for the first time. You live in a dorm with a bunch of other young people. Suddenly, you find yourself in a world of people your age, with very few responsibilities and not a lot of oversight. It's crazy. It's a crazy time. You go to parties, fall in love, form close friendships. Sometimes you study, but really not much. College campuses are very comfortable places in America. My campus, for example, you know, a state school, had free gyms all over the place and a pool to use. I joined an acapella club and I volunteered in a local rock venue. So the point I'm making is that, you know, going to college consists of a lot more than just going to your classes. In fact, for many Americans, going to classes is quite a minor part of their college experience. In Spain, college is not such a huge personal step. It's not a major turning point in your personal journey. It's not mythologized like it is in America. I've never met a Spanish person who had a lot of pride about where they went to school or strong nostalgia for their college days or who even really talked about their college experience at all. Meanwhile, you meet Americans who dream of going to specific schools and whose whole friend group is from their college days. Really, university in Spain, as in much of Europe, is more like a continuation of high school. You're going to school. That's the point. Most students don't even move out of their parents' house to, go to get their undergraduate degrees. And even if they do, it's quite rare, quite rare to move onto a dormitory on a college campus. So one significant reason that college in America is so expensive, I think, is that it's become so much more than just about going to school. I mean, think about college sports. Each university in America has its own mascot, its spirit band, its, its colors, its star athletes. This doesn't exist at all in Europe. My girlfriend doesn't know her school's animal. Her school doesn't have an animal. My school, Stony Brook's animal, by the way, is entirely fictional. It's a sea wolf. And we had our own cheer for the football games. What's a sea wolf? I'm a sea wolf. Yeah, it's silly. In America, we expect high-profile guests to give a speech at our college graduation. And in each of these speeches, they praise us for being the best and the brightest that the world has ever seen. And they give us some wise advice. So leaving college is a major ritual too. Again, this is not the case in Spain. There are no viral Spanish graduation speak speeches. You know, it's just, it's, uh, you know, you're going from studying to working or not working, whatever the case may be. Since moving to Spain, I've come to see the American rituals of college as just a bit ridiculous. A lot of it is fueled, I think, by our culture of competition. In the United States, there are a handful of extremely prestigious schools and a limited number of spots. And where you go to school is therefore a big determiner of your career. It becomes part of your personal journey. And in America, we love to talk about our careers as personal journeys. And it even becomes a part of your identity, your alma mater. So this is partly why we demand so much from our college experiences. We don't go to college for knowledge, or at least not primarily. We go to college to take our rightful place in the hierarchy of society. We're supposed to emerge transformed, imbued with the prestige of our institution. And if you don't believe me, just talk to anyone who's gone to an Ivy League school. Either they reject it with bitterness, or it's a part of who they are, or who they think they are. When universities are responsible 
for providing such an all-inclusive package, dormitories, food, social life, entertainment, psychological and physical health, life-defining education. It's no wonder that they're going to cost a lot. What you're paying for, in the end, is a transformative experience, and arguably you're paying for the brand itself. You're paying to make the brand a part of you. Think about that. Sounds a little creepy. Even public universities in the United States, like my school, pay huge amounts of money or spend huge amounts of money in marketing in order to bolster their university's brand. The better the brand, the higher the ranking, the more prestigious the university, and the more money the university can charge to bestow its prestige on its clients. I mean students. I mean the students are clients paying for this label. Anyway, I'm getting carried away, but I hope you see my point. In Spain, you're paying for your classes and not much else, and you come away with the university not as uh, an alumni, as part of an alumni situ, uh, an alumni group celebrating your alma mater, impressing people when you mention your college's name. You emerge from university in Spain with a degree that certifies that you learned specific knowledge right? That's it. That's what it's about. That's what college is supposed to be about. To me, I think it's just a much healthier system. Not least because people don't drive themselves crazy competing to get into the best university possible. Because if you have a degree in teaching from one university, it's basically equivalent to a degree in teaching from another university. Likewise, if you want to be an engineer or this or that. But in America, we go to college, we get a degree, and often the thing you study doesn't even matter that much. Like, what's worth more? A degree in English literature from a state school or a degree in photography from Columbia? The, the school matters at least as much, if not more, than what you study or the knowledge that you've acquired. Again, let that sink in. That's pretty crazy to think about. I have personally a limited experience going to a Spanish university. Last year, I completed a master's at the Universidad de Alcalá de Henares in the Instituto Franklin, which is a part of the University of Alcalá de Henares that specializes in American studies and also courses for Americans abroad. The master's took me one year to complete, and it cost me about $4,000. Not a bad deal. As an aside, Alcalá de Henares is worth visiting just to see the historic university buildings, which are quite beautiful. The oldest continuously operating university in the country, by the way, is in Salamanca, and it was founded in the 12th century. So if you're in Salamanca, a beautiful city in any case, also worth a visit to see the old university building. Anyway, so I didn't even want to focus this podcast entirely on higher education, uh, I also want to talk about the Escuela Oficial de Idiomas, the official school of languages. This is an initiative of the Spanish government to subsidize low-cost language classes outside the university, mainly for adults. This year, I began taking classes at one of the official schools in order to revive my atrophying German skills, and it's been a great experience. I paid a little more than 200 euros for a whole academic year of classes. And that works out to what? Two euros per hour of class? It's a very good deal. And the classes are quality. With properly qualified teachers, a well-established curriculum, you know, the whole deal. I'm learning a lot. Ich spreche gut Deutsch. So there are dozens of these official schools in Madrid alone. And about half a million students are enrolled in Spain. My particular school, which is at Jesus Maestro, has a very wide range of languages on offer. Besides German, there are other major European languages like French, Italian, and English. There's Spanish for foreigners, quite useful if you're an immigrant. And there are also the other three official languages of Spain, Basque, Catalan, and Galician. Aside from this, the school offers Dutch, Danish, Arabic, Greek, Gaelic, and Chinese, and that's only the short list. Oh, and Russian, too. Yeah. So if you want to become a polyglot, 
this is the place to be. The school's resources also extend beyond the classroom. There are language exchanges where you could find someone to trade languages. You know, they want to learn English. I want to learn whatever, German. And there are also cultural talks and events. And there's even a choir, which maybe I'll join. But of course, you know, being run by the government, there are a few things to be desired. The school is in an ugly old building. One of the two elevators has been broken for two months, so I have to walk up five floors to my class. Enrolling is a total pain. The website is dysfunctional. You need to go to a bank to pay the fee. You need to wait in line, blah, 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 you know, bureaucracy. But for what you pay, it's a great deal. In fact, I think that having a public school for language training is a wonderful idea and one that I, we should embrace in the States. At the very least, it would be a great resource for immigrants who are trying to learn English. And it might hate, help Americans with our famous monolingualism. I would go even further and suggest that the model of the official school should be extended for other sorts of things. Computer coding or photography. Any kind of skill that adults might want to learn. On purely economic terms, investing in education usually pays off. And after all, a multilingual workforce can outcompete a monolingual one. I think. Anyway. In general, my experience in Spain have made me a strong believer in public education as uninspiring and inefficient as it can sometimes be, admittedly. I think in America we lose a lot more than we gain when we conceive of college as a giant competition for a limited amount of prestige and status. Education should be about equalizing opportunities and not exacerbating differences, which is it so often does in America. Needless to say, graduating with tens of thousands of debt, tens of thousands of dollars of debt, also isn't ideal. I'll give you a concrete example. A few weeks ago, I met a man from Scotland who's been living in Germany. He began to study German, language, and literature. But a few years into his undergraduate degree, he decided he didn't like it, since he decided he didn't like working as a translator or a teacher. And he stopped. Now, in America, if you started a degree and then stopped, you would now be deeply in debt and you wouldn't have a college degree to help you get a job to pay off this debt. You'd have to start working like a crazy person to try to pay it off and uh, you'd, have a, you'd have a hard time. And even in America, you can get loans from the federal government, but these loans often have a high interest rate. So, well, thanks. But, you know, this guy... He didn't have to do that. He didn't sink under, under the weight of debt because he didn't have any debt. A few years later, he re-enrolled as an undergraduate to study music, and now he is working his way through college, just like we used to do in America, paying for his living expenses and all of his tuition-related costs with a part-time job. Isn't that beautiful? So to many millennials in America, including me, stories like this, seem too good to be true. You know, it's, it's just so impossible nowadays in America to do anything like this. But, you know, are we willing to give up our mythologized college culture and settle into treating university as just more school? School that isn't necessarily transformative and which isn't necessarily the right step for each person and which doesn't fundamentally give you a, a network of alumni that you can depend on for the rest of your life, that's just a school. Can we give that up in America? Hard to tell. Thank you. <laughs>